Second talk. Uh, slides are online, same spot, CM2. This morning's talk was CM1. And let's get right into it. We are about to release PHP 7 in, well, within about two to three weeks, probably at this point. So, thank you. It, it was supposed to come out this week that just passed, but we did find a rather nasty bug, or the Drupal folks found a rather nasty bug. So we had to have another release candidate, so we pushed the release out a couple of weeks. But I think we're good to go for early December. So the big, big thing in PHP 7 is that it is super duper fast. Pretty much anything you throw at it will run twice as fast as before. Some things will be even faster than twice as fast. And you'll see drastic memory reduction as well on your existing code. Some highlights of new features. This one is a bit obtuse. You may not have heard of this one before. Um, this is a secondary file-based opcode cache. So the opcode cache sits in between the PHP parser and the executor. PHP, like most scripting languages, is a two-stage process. First, you parse the PHP script into a set of opcodes, and then the executor executes those opcodes. The cache is a shared memory cache that sits in between those two stages so that we don't have to go back to disk and reparse. So the second time you hit a script, it will be cached in shared memory, and we execute directly out of shared memory, which is much, much faster than having to go to disk every time. However, if you restart PHP, or if you're running PHP from the command line, that shared memory cache is destroyed. When the CLI script ends, it's destroyed, or when you restart PHP for log rotation, for example, or maybe you even have a crappy deploy system that needs a restart, you lose your shared memory cache. And that means it has to reparse everything and that can slow down the initial requests. This file-based cache allows you to keep a, an on-disk version of that cache so you can restart PHP and they can repopulate from disk without having to reparse. So it's not quite as fast as the shared memory cache, of course. If this is index.php from WordPress. So if that takes 1x time, executing it from shared memory cache takes, is 10x, 10 times faster. Grabbing it from a compiled version of index.php from disk is about four times faster. So you don't quite get the same speed, but it can speed up restarts. An interesting use for this is just to turn it on for CLI scripts. So a very popular CLI script is Composer. So in this case, I've turned it on for Composer, and you can see running Composer takes about 40 milliseconds the first time, and that's when it's writing, um, the, it's writing the parsed files to disk. Then the second time I run it, it takes 19 milliseconds instead, so it's a little bit more than twice as fast. All your CLI scripts, on top of the extra speed you get from PHP 7, by turning on the file-based disk cache, you get another 100% improvement, basically, on it. So if you have cron jobs or any other things that you're running from CLI and PHP, they will be much, much, much faster in PHP 7, especially if you turn on the file-based cache. And to com in comparison, it takes about 33 milliseconds for completely uncached composer every time. So you hit, get a little bit of a hit the first time because it has to write to cache, but then subsequent runs are faster. This is what it actually looks like when it cached Composer. Composer is a FAR file, which is a PHP archive. So inside Composer, there are actually a whole bunch of files. And the caching reveals the, the internals of Composer. Another new feature, an AST. So the new parser in PHP 7 is based on an abstract syntax tree. And that lets you do many, many interesting things. So in this case, I'm taking a line of PHP code, and I'm dumping the abstract syntax tree. So here, very simple, echo substring with two arguments. So you see a statement list, you see an echo, and there's a function call, which is an AST call node, and then the name of the function is substring, and that has an argument list. First one is a simple string, ABC. The second one is an array with two elements. So that is how the language is represented in a tree. 
which is then walked. Or you can walk it and do interesting things. In my case, I've written a little static analyzer that walks through this thing, and it looks and finds, whoa, wait a second, substring doesn't take um, an array as the second argument. So it, it, my static analyzer is telling you argument two is an integer array, an array of integers, right? But it's supposed to just take an integer. So you can write tools like this that walks across this AST and does all kinds of different syntax checks. And I expect to see over the next 12 to 18 months, I expect to see a whole bunch of different tools that makes use of this because it's so easy to grab the AST out of PHP now. Previously, you'd first have to create your own AST, which is a lot of work. And then, and then you have to keep it up to date with changes in the language and stuff. Now that the language is AST based, it's natural, it comes right out of it. Um, it'll always be up to date because if it wasn't, the language wouldn't work. Another new feature, exceptions on fatals. Most fatals are now actually exceptions, which means that you can catch them. It also means that you get a stack trace by default. So a common one is to chain things but not do any error checking. So you might have seen this um, calling to a member function um, on, on something that's not an object, in this case, null, right? This now gives you a fatal error, which is actually an exception, which you can catch if you want. Um, and you can catch the error here. We had to make a, we had to split the exception hierarchy a little bit to do this in order to be completely backward compatible. If you had a catch all type thing, it would just said catch exception, you probably didn't mean to catch fatal errors like this. So the new exception hierarchy looks like this. Exception is just as it was before, but now it extends or it implements the throwable interface. So a sister um, to that exception class is now the error class. And that also extends throwable and it, it's further subclassed into type error and parse error. So type errors is if you get the type wrong to something that has a type on it. Um, parse errors, straight parse errors. Um, parse errors, I'm not sure why we'd catch it. The one place you might want to catch a parse error is if you're doing some kind of eval. If you're doing eval, which is usually a bad idea, but you may have some code that does an eval. In this case, you could catch an actual parse error in a string that you're evaling. New feature, return types. The syntax is this, colon, and then the type that this function is supposed to return. If you get it wrong, you get an exception, type error exception um, with a stack trace. So in this case, I said it's supposed to return an array, but I returned a scalar, an integer, um, and it tells you you got it wrong. We also have scalar types on actual function and method calls now. There are two modes for it. There's the standard coercive scalar types that PHP has had for a long time, or the, the standard coercion rules that PHP has used for a long time. It means that you can be sure that inside your function, if you put a scalar type on it, you will get those types inside the function if PHP is able to coerce the data to that. So even though here I'm passing in an integer one, and this is type to a string, we can, with a lot of confidence, convert integer one to string one and just let stuff work. Basically, because the web is not typed, you end up doing a lot of work, especially the, at the upper layers of your application, if you have to cast everything all the time, and it's a bit of a pain. Lower down in the application libraries, it makes more sense for stronger typing, but at the very top that deals with stuff that's coming from the web or even from databases, since those things aren't typed, you get everything as strings. It's usually better to just coerce them into the right types as you go. Um, in this case, I want an int and I'm passing in two and a half bananas. And it says, oh, wait a second. Um, and give, it does give you a notice here saying, this is not a very well-formed value, um, numeric value, because you're asking for an integer and you gave them 2.5 bananas, right? So you do get a notice here, but it's still, tries, and it still gives you an integer two plus a notice. Now, 
you can turn everything strict and you can say, okay, now I've been playing around with cursive types. This is a library function. I want the right types, damn it. I want them everywhere. And you can say declare strict types equals one. And now you're going to get very strict error messages. It'll give you a fatal error on this one here saying, wait, you cannot pass an integer. This wants a string. Stop right here. So those are the two modes for scalar typing. We have anonymous classes, just like anonymous functions. You can create throwaway classes on the fly, pass them around. So if you just wanted to return an anonymous class, you can return new class and off you go. There's a null, null coalesce operator. This is to try to get rid of boilerplate, is set, is empty, or if empty type things that you've probably seen everywhere. This does not throw any sort of notice on undefined. It basically returns the first thing that is non-empty in the PHP sense of the word empty. So A or B, A is null, B is one, so you get one, All right? C or B, well C is two, so you're gonna get two. A, B or C, A is null, B is one, so that's gonna return null. A, X or C, X isn't even defined, right? So you have a null, you have an undefined, and you have C. So you're gonna get C back from that without any notices or warnings. So you have to be careful. If you typo something in a coalesce string, you're not gonna get any notice on that. It's simply going to say, hey, this is not defined, it's empty. What's the next one in the chain? But it does, for something like default values, for like get parameters that aren't provided and things like that, and then providing a default value, it's very, very, very handy just to put question mark, question mark, and then the default value. There's a spaceship operator. This is for comparison functions. We found that a lot of people manage to get their comparisons function wrong. If you don't have a stable comparison function, your sorts are going to be messed up. If A is less than B, then B has to be greater than A. Um, and if your comparison function doesn't do that right, then the sort is broken. Um, this will do the right thing automatically. It will return minus one if A is less than B, one if it's greater, and zero if it's equal all in one little operator. And my son tells me the spaceship is actually a tie advanced one, X one. I don't quite see it, but he is sure that this is the spaceship. Um, zero cost assertions, these are cool. There are three modes to assert in PHP 7. You can put a cert in your code. If you set send assertions to zero, you're not gonna get any assert warnings. You can turn them on. Send assertions equals one. Um, and in this case, test 17. 17 does not meet this, so you're gonna get an 17 is invalid. Or finally, if in your INI file, and this doesn't work inside the code, but in your INI file, you can set it to minus one. That means that when we parse PHP and create the opcodes in the cache, we don't even put the assert opcode in there, which means it's completely zero cost. It's like a comment that gets stripped out. So in production mode, you might want to have send assertions equals minus one in your INI file in production. And then in dev mode and unit testing and stuff, you can put all the asserts you want. You can litter your code with asserts, thousands of them, and they will have zero impact on your production system. But you'll get all these asserts evaluated in the development mode. We've added a closure call. This is just a shortcut for bind to essentially, so if you have a closure that you then need to bind to another object when you call it, you can do a call with the object that you want that closure to be bound to. Simple little shortcut. We've removed a whole bunch of PHP 4 features. Chances are, if you're still relying on all these PHP 4 things that we've been warning you about for about 12 years to stop doing, it will probably stop working now in PHP 7. There's some new reserved words. So if you have a class called string, it's gonna work, break. Um, true, false, null, basically things that you wouldn't expect to be able to use in your own code, you can't use in PHP 7. And a bit of work on how we handle numbers, specifically on Windows. We now have full 64-bit integer support on Windows. Even if you're running 64-bit Windows before with PHP 5, you're still only getting 32-bit integers. 
because there was a bit of work to be done to, to clean that all up. That's all been done now. Underflows and overflows are handled in the same manner. And weird octals. In PHP 5, if you put an invalid octal, so any number that starts with a zero is an octal, right? So 08 is not a valid octal. And in PHP 5, you would just silently get zero out of this. In PHP 7, you now get a parse error. It doesn't even parse. Uniform variable syntax. This was to clean up a whole bunch of weird inconsistencies in how we parse things in PHP 5 to make it easier to have a sane AST, AppSec syntax tree. Because without this, making an AST that would implement some of the weird precedence things we had in PHP 5 was just way too ugly. So there is a little bit of a backward compatibility problem here for long complex expressions. Now, the main one you'll hit is something like this. This is actually pretty hard to read. I mean, what does this mean? Does this mean that we're looking for a belongs to property that's an array and then we want the column element? Or is there a local variable called belongs to that we then, that has an array with a column that then holds the name of a property we want to access, right? You could read it two ways. You could read the right side first and expand that, or you can do the left side first. In PHP 5, it actually does the right side first. It expands this into whatever value that is, and then it looks for a property with that name. In PHP 7, it goes the other way. Everything is left to right now. So if you want to preserve the PHP 5 behavior, you'll have to put in curly braces in this one case, right? And there are, there are other cases, things that you shouldn't be doing probably, um, stuff like this. Big, long, run-on expressions that it's impossible to figure out what they do just by looking at them. Now you actually can in PHP 7 because you know everything is left to right. If I don't want it left to right, I'm gonna have to put some braces in to explain to the parser what I'm trying to do. There's a new Unicode code point escape syntax, backslash u. You put the code point in and then it's an easier way of, of printing out weird characters. There's an internal char class that's been added to the Intel extension. And we're hoping, I'm not sure we're gonna hit November 26th. It's Thanksgiving in the US and it might be too tough on, on us, but definitely by December 12th, I figure we'll have it out. So, a little bit more on this 100% speed up. This is a 20 year old project. This is not new code where we can just find the sleep three and delete it and get a performance improvement. There is no sleep three. There is no magic thing we could do to speed things up. This was thousands and thousands of micro optimizations, mostly done by three guys that took WordPress 3.6. Um, in all of 2014, they started in January 2014, and it took 26 seconds to do 100 page views of the front page of WordPress 3.6. And then they iterated. Slowly but surely, they got that down to 12 seconds by the end of 2014. Same on the number of instructions. So it took about 9 billion instructions to serve it initially and they got that down to 2.9 billion instructions. So this is very old code that you essentially remove two thirds of all the instructions without changing the functionality. If you think about your own code, it's like okay, here's a complex piece of code that's been around for 20 years, delete two thirds of all the lines, but don't change any functionality, right? That's close to magic. It really is. It's very close to magic. And it's amazing the job that they were able to do with the code. Some of the things that we ended up doing was reducing the ZVAL, which is kind of the base union struct inside PHP, from 24 down to 16 bytes. Doesn't sound like a lot, but there are thousands of these things. And when there are thousands of ZVALs, eight bytes on each one is quite a bit. Hash table size reduced, hash table bucket size reduced, um, and some various optimizations on how we handle arrays. So for example, this example, where we keep 
appending an array to an array, so it's a set of nested arrays with strings inside each one. PHP 5 would take 43 megs for 100,000 elements. PHP 7 takes 6 megs of memory to do exactly the same thing. So massive memory savings in certain circumstances. Lots of other things. We looked at CPU cache lines. Um, memory allocator, stole some ideas from J.E. Malik. Faster hash table iteration, all kinds of things like this. We're using some tricks in the latest GCC as well, or in modern versions of GCC. So if you're building your own PHP, make sure your GCC is at least level at version 4.8 to get some of these optimizations, and then thousands and thousands of micro-optimizations. We've also added huge page support in Opcache. Huge pages is a, a Linux thing where you can allocate certain chunks of memory to be, um, to be used as huge blocks, and Opcache can make use of it if you choose to do so. It gives you maybe five, six percent extra performance if you do that. Um, and we have no JIT yet. It'll be interesting to see if we can come up with a, with a decent JIT, because right now we, we have no JIT in there. We've just sped up the base PHP. And I think with a JIT, which addresses hotspots in applications, we can get another big performance boost at some point. But it's hard to write a good JIT. It, it really is. So it'll, it's going to take a while. Um, but I do foresee a JIT in, in PHP's future. And then you can expect another boost in performance. So some numbers. Don't trust my numbers. Do your own benchmarking, please. I'm not trying to lie to you with these numbers. I, I did my best. Um, all my specs for everything on my configurations is here. You can try to reproduce them. Or just do your own. Just benchmark your own code that you're interested in. So first off, Drupal 8. This is PHP 5.5, 5, 5, 5.6, PHP 7, and the latest HHVM 3.10. So we didn't quite get a 100% performance improvement on Drupal 8. You can see it went from 13.60 or so up to 19.74. Um, pretty much the same speed as HHVM on that one. And this is doing 20 concurrent requests. If we up that to 40, the picture looks pretty much the same. If we look at the latency numbers, it's what you would expect as well. Obviously, latency lower is better. So it drops from 14.7 milliseconds down to 10.1 milliseconds latency here. So not quite double for Drupal. WordPress, drastic improvement on WordPress. Most, mostly because both the PHP 7 team and the HHVM team uses WordPress as a guinea pig. So we look at the WordPress code and we try to figure out how do we speed up the language for this particular code. So here you see basically a 3x. Like if you're using PHP 5.3, going from 200 requests per second to 626 for PHP 7 and 656 for HHVM. This little gap bothered me a bit. It's like, ah, what the heck? We're so close. So I, I did a bit of geekery on this one, some, some heavy duty geeking. Um, and I used a feature in GCC called FTO. FTO is feedback directed optimization. And you can build a binary, a profiling binary essentially, and then you can train that binary against the code that you want it to run. So you do it like this. Um, PHP's makefile supports this. You do make prof gen. So that generates a profiling binary. Then you run the WordPress front page a thousand times on that binary. So PHP CGI minus T lets you repeat the thing a thousand times. And then prof clean and prof use. That tells DCC, now use this profiling data and create this tuned binary that's tuned specifically for WordPress. And aha. So PHP 7 and PHP 7 with FDO tuned for WordPress got up to 658. <laughs> um, and it, it is kind of cheating, but at the same time, if you are a WordPress shop or if you are a single application shop, if you're an ISP that has to run everything, this has no value. But if your company has a single code base that's quite monolithic, why not build a PHP that's tuned specifically for the code that's going to be running every day? And you can get 
three, four percent maybe, well, probably not that much, but two, three percent of a speed up um, by doing this, depending on, on your code. Some others, PHPBB, popular bulletin board. PHP 7 is quite a bit faster than everything. And you, here we did get our 100% improvement even over PHP 5.6. Um, if we look at latency, latency dropped by a ton as well. More than double. MediaWiki, this one um, about 2x as well. HHVM has tuned quite a bit for MediaWiki, so they're a bit ahead on that one. Open cart. Here you don't see the big gap. The reason you don't see the big gap is that OpenCart is really database heavy. Every single request hits the database multiple times. Some of them are full table scans as well. No matter what we do in PHP, we're not going to be able to speed up your database. So if your code is spending most of its time in the database, sorry, you're not going to get anything from, from PHP 7. We got a little bit out of it, um, but you can see all the versions are struggling um, with open cart. Wardrobe, this was a, a random Laravel Symphony application that I grabbed off of GitHub just to see what rather modern PHP apps might see from PHP 7. And you can see it's a drastic dump, jump up in PHP 7 versus everything else, even over HHVM. Geeklog. Another random blogging platform I downloaded and installed. And the interesting thing was that this stuff works out of the box. I didn't have to make any changes at all to get it working on PHP 7. Magento 2, new Magento that was just released, I think, or will be released imminently. Much, much faster on PHP 7. Track, the bug tracking thing. This one didn't work out of the box. And this is where I got my example of the, the left to right stuff. It had this, right? And they actually meant, so they had a local variable called belongs to, right? And they constructed some kind of variable with an ID or something, which is the name of the property. And it, it's kind of weird code to begin with, right? So you don't hit it very often, but in this case, they were creating dynamic property names um, and then doing it. And the only thing I had to do was toss in curlies, and then, then it worked. Cache um, is a status app. Again, much, much faster on PHP 7. Moodle, educational software tracks classes and things like that. Tons faster on PHP 7 as well. The Moodle people are going to be really happy, I think. Zencart, again, we did not get 100% performance improvement. Most of these shopping cart applications spend a lot of time in the database. Looking at memory use, it's, it's hard to measure memory because there's a lot of different aspects to memory use. There are shared libraries where the memory gets shared. So just looking at PS is very confusing, I think. Um, top doesn't help much either because Resident doesn't give you much shared, doesn't give you a virtual, doesn't really mean because half of that stuff is shared stuff. So I like a tool called SMEM. And it has a concept of proportional set size that evenly distributes all the shared memory that are spread across all the processes. So in this case, I'm running 10 PHP FPM processes. And the proportional set size for each one is about 621. Now, if I ran 20, that proportion would probably go down a little bit. It would probably go down to like maybe 400 because the shared memory is spread over more processes. But I think this is a fair way of measuring how much memory 10 PHP FPM processes are using. So in this case, the 6.1 makes. And then if I start giving it some traffic, we can see it grows to 12.9 megs when it's serving up Drupal 8. So that's what these numbers and these graphs are based on, is the proportional set size. So base use with no load yet, I just started it up, I haven't hit it at all, is a little bit lower for PHP 7 versus the others. Not that this means much. You don't really care about memory use before you start using it. Once you start hitting it, Drupal 8 dropped from about 41 
down to 12 or 13 megs per process, or for the 10 processes. WordPress basically disappeared, right? It doesn't need memory at all. Um, PHP BB, this one didn't drop much. It is still lower, but for some reason the patterns in PHP BB, maybe there are a lot of um, database result sets and stuff and big strings that come from the database, it's gonna take a certain amount. There's just nothing we can do about that one. Moodle, again, Moodle does not need memory anymore. <laughs> um, wardrobe, dropped by a ton, by a factor of three memory use. Um, I, I didn't do the others, but you, get an, you can get the idea that for certain patterns, memory drops drastically. You can hope that you hit the right patterns. Maybe we should all just run WordPress, actually. So, as you are um, upgrading to PHP 7 in the next three weeks, right? I think the top three things that are gonna hit you, this left to right semantics thing we talked about, this is probably the trickiest one. The static analyzer that I wrote called FAN, that you can grab off of GitHub, can detect these, or at least try to detect them. Um, or maybe a unit, you have unit tests, and unit, unit tests will catch this. But this is the trickiest one to catch. Second one is that we removed the eval on PREG replace. So you have to now use PREG replace callback. So if you have any slash E's, which doesn't actually eval, for security reasons, this was just too ugly. You'll have to go through and put the same thing in as a um, PREG replace call. And here, this was actually me doing it in my own presentation system. I made this mistake with the left to right, and I'd forgotten my curlies in this case. But it's not that hard to catch these ones. You can just grab all your PREG replaces and see if you have any slash E's and, and fix those. And finally, your octals. Now, if you have invalid octals, it's not gonna parse anymore. This one's super easy to find. You can just do PHP minus L, just lint it, and it'll catch them. So my fan tool, static analysis, has a bunch of switches on it. The one for checking for potential BC issues from PHP 5 to 7 is minus B. So you can do fan minus B on your code. And on, in this case where I had forgotten my curlies, it came up and said here, compat error, expression may not be PHP 7 compatible, right? It could be. It, it's hard for the static analyzer to know if this was actually what you meant. But when you give minus B, you're saying, I have PHP 5 code, show me any places where this might behave differently in PHP 7, and it'll give you the line numbers and everything. So that'll be a bit of a help to you when you migrate. When you run it in full static analysis mode, it gives you all kinds of stuff. So here I grabbed monologue and had a look at what it gives you. So it looks at types as well, and sees when types might be wrong and, and stuff like that. So it can help find issues for you. Deploying it. Now, when I talk to companies, I talk to folks on how do you deploy your PHP, it's amazing how many people get it wrong. They're using things like Capistrano and other things that don't deploy correctly. You want atomic deploys, you d and you don't want to blow your caches, you don't want restarts, you don't want to have to clear things and not cache. None of this stuff is necessary. You just have to think it through. So you have a web server, you have, I, the way I do it, I have two document routes, an A and a B. If I'm currently serving A, I have active requests. I rsync all my stuff to another directory B, and then at some point I flip the symlink. When I flip the symlink, I now want to make sure that any request that started on A does not end up on B, because then if you have like an include, and then you change that include file, things go weird, because the code may not be compatible. The B version of the include may not be compatible with the A code that's about to include it. So, it looks like this. You end up with requests running on A, and they have to keep running on A, and new requests starting on B. So essentially, you're running two versions of your site at the same time, for, for like a fraction of a second. And your, your system has to be such that that's possible. The easy way to achieve it to make sure that the request that starts on A finishes on A is simply to set the document route to the target. So at the web server level, at the beginning of the request, 
you have the web server look at the target of the sim link and just hard code the document root. It says, hey, PHP, your document root for this request is A. Go. If halfway through that request, I flip the sim link, it doesn't matter because it looked at it at the start of the request and it's going to continue on A. Then all new requests will be on B. And I flip back and forth so I don't blow up my caches. So I just rsync new files. So now I'm on B, then I rsync my new stuff to A so that only files that changed will have to be reparsed and cached. So I don't blow any caches that way. I just keep flipping back and forth. Unlike stuff like Capistrano that makes a new directory every time, which means you blow your cache on every deploy. You don't want to do that either. So do an A and a B flip back and forth and configure your web server correctly to look at the target of the sim link. With Nginx, it's easy. You just set your document root to real path root. Unfortunately, Apache doesn't have a feature to do this. So I wrote an Apache module called mod real doc that can do it for you. You can grab it off of GitHub. Of course, you have to avoid hard coding full paths. Make sure all your paths are relative to the document root. If you have paths relative to the top level sim link, this will all blow up on you. Um, watch your include path setting. Ink path is another extension that can help you fix your include path. And version all your static assets. And finally, this doesn't help you if you're changing your DB schema. Any shared assets, if you have two versions of your site running at the same time, and it expects two different versions of the schema in the database, well, it's not going to work. You're going to have to have another mechanism for updating your database schemas. Um, probably don't have time. I'll go through this quickly. At Etsy, we use IRC to manage our deploys. It's actually quite cool. There's a channel, a push channel. You join the channel and you say, join the push. And then you have this whole protocol, basically, that you interact with a push bot and a dev bot and Jenkins all give you feedback. But that's how we manage multiple developers all pushing together is through this IRC channel. We're using Deployinator. This is a tool we wrote, web-based thing with just push buttons. Push to the QA system that we call Princess, get saved by the Princess, this button. And then once you go through the IRC protocol, eventually you can say deploy to production, and it all just works and it flows. And it's actually a very, very comforting and, and relaxing system to use in the sense that you always know what's going on and everybody can sit in that one channel. So we don't have a push master or anything. Anybody can deploy anytime simply by going into the IRC channel and joining the push group. Um, when we deploy to production, we SS, well, the deploy neither SSH to the deploy host and does a D shell, a distributed shell, R syncs to all the web servers, um, and it then lets you know in the IRC channel that this is happening. And we graph everything, StatsD, Ganglia, Graphite. We log everything. Logster is a tool we wrote for gathering log files. Supergrep is a t another tool we wrote for looking at all the log files from all your servers in one web interface. Logstash, Elasticsearch, elastic for managing and querying your log files. We always commit to master, deploy from head. We have no branches in Git. Any branches are done via feature flags in the code. So we're always pushing from head, always pushing from head, always moving forward. We never revert. That requires blameless postmodems because we mess up. And we try not to blame each other for the mess ups. So we, we move really fast, we make lots of mistakes, but we try to then figure out what went wrong so it doesn't happen again. Links to all of these tools that we built for managing this whole architecture are all here on this slide. So Morg is actually a tool for managing postmortems. Feature is our feature flag implementation that manages features within our application. And all this other stuff is here too. So, you really should have tested PHP 7 already because we're getting so close to release. Please do so. I have a Vagrant image. It's very, very easy. Git clone, GitHub, or the other of PHP 7 dev that grabs a Vagrant image. You can Vagrant SSH into it, and you have lots of different versions of PHP, 24 different compiled versions, actually. And you can switch versions just by typing new PHP and the version you want. So you can test your app on every version of PHP, 
from PHP 5.3 up to 7 um, and track down any issues you might have without having to install PHP 7 yourself. You can build a new version, make PHP 7. So very, very easy. Thank you. All right, shut up, shut up. We need like two minutes for questions, yes. So in the company we use the HHDM, do you see any way that the flash to flu architecture can convert and reflect one? Uh, no, next question. Backward compatibility for send framework. I think they've already addressed that in the next version of the framework. Um, there are very, very few changes at the user space level. Internally in PHP 7, everything has changed. But for code, very few things have changed. So you saw my putting the curly braces in. Zen framework has already done that in the few places. Because it doesn't make it incompatible with PHP 5. It just makes it forward compatible with PHP 7. So I'm pretty damn sure that the current version of, of Zen Framework is already PHP 7 compatible. I can't, I'm not 100% sure, but I would be astounded if it wasn't compatible already. Yes? I, I tried so many times to uh, do the uh, PHP XP, but I have uh, to do it with uh, the internal representation. Okay. That's a way to access the Oh, how do you access the AST from userland? There is an extension called php-ast on GitHub. It wasn't quite ready for PHP 7.0. I'm pretty sure we'll include it in 7.1. I am from my So you just compile the extension and you have access to it. Yeah, just look for, it's written by Nikita, but just look for php-ast on GitHub. You'll find it easily. Yes, one more. Sure, why not? <laughs> All right, one last question, and I'm out of here. No? No more HHVM questions, damn it. <laughs> All right, what? No, it's not looking more like Java. Man, you're here to annoy me today, aren't you? <laughs> All right, w one better question to end on. Yes. What about PHP 8? I have no idea. What the hell? <laughs> we're just, we've been struggling like crazy getting PHP 7 out the door. Ask me in like six, eight, ten months. Then we'll, we'll start talking about PHP 8. I have no idea right now. Sorry. All right. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, okay.